So, hello everyone, and welcome to the um, Middlebury Science Cafe. We are super excited to be hosting Allison today to talk about um, Agents of Destruction, which is just a really cool title. <laughs> so when I actually first talked to Allison, oh my god, it was like back in January. So it was like almost right after the windstorm, and the tree had crashed into the windows. Oh, the yeah. Museum. oh yes. geez, yeah. And I saw it on Instagram, and I'm like, <laughs> Wow, imagine like all of the things you have to worry about when you have these amazing collections that it's your job to keep safe and protected. Uh, little did we know that we would be having another natural disaster yeah. in Vermont just in time for your talk. So, um, really looking forward to it. <laughs> if it is, maybe we won't invite you to come back again. <laughs> it's like, it's cool. <laughs> but we're all good on weather events. Um, but so, yeah, you're going to tell us a lot more about um, water and wind and all kinds of other things that can threaten um, museum collections. Yes. Go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you. Uh, so my name is Allison, and I am the collections manager at the Henry Sheldon Museum, which if you haven't been, is literally right across the street, so you should go. <laughs> Um, and yes, I'm here to talk to you today about the agents of deterioration, or now I'm going to think about this as a slideshow, all of my worries. Um, so these are the 10 primary threats to heritage objects, and I'll give you some quick overviews about how I try to combat them, but obviously this could be a you know, year-long presentation. <laughs> so first I'll start by describing what a collections manager does, so what my job entails um, in the broader sense. It can look very different at any different museum, depending on the size of the museum, the size of the budget, the size of the staff, the types of collections, etc. So in my position, the Sheldon Museum is a very small staff, um, so I have to wear lots of hats. Uh, we do have an archivist on staff, which is great, so I don't have to worry about the paper collections, so my purview is primarily the 3D objects. Um, so some of what my job entails is maintenance, which you know means cleaning, proper storage conditions, all of that. Registration, which is tracking object movements, maintaining the object database, uh, writing and updating policies and procedures, that type of stuff. Uh, I also work on exhibits, so I curate the exhibits, and I also do the fabrication and everything that goes with exhibits. Um, and I also do a bit of the facilities, uh, which in my job includes kind of monitoring for pests and taking care of the building environment, things like that. But essentially what it all boils down to is risk management. So I'm constantly monitoring the collection and the spaces for risks. Um, and I try to respond to those parent threats and do what I can to minimize them. Uh, the saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, is so true and very relevant in my job. So we'll start out with what are the agents of deterioration besides a really cool band name um, i did not come up with it so it is a risk management strategy that was developed in the 1990s by the canadian conservation institute uh, and they broke down the risks to collections according to these 10 outside forces that pose threats to collections um, so object built vulnerabilities woof, uh, to each of these agents vary widely depending on the material of the collection itself um, and then also the likelihood and extent of an event occurring. So, you know, if you're in a blood prone area, things like that. Um, the risk analysis, this risk analysis provides a methodology for determining which of these agents pose the biggest threats to collections. Um, and this information can then be used by people in my position to uh, use preservation planning to implement appropriate monitoring and mitigation strategies. So you'll also see up on this screen, the 11th thing I have up there is Inherent Vice, also a cool band name, but it is not one of the agents. I put it up there because it's a related concept, um, but whereas the agents of deterioration are outside forces, Inherent Vice is a condition which an object deteriorates just due to the incompatible or unstable nature of the object itself. So you see that a lot with like old plastics, for instance. You know, I'm sure you've all come across that weird old plastic item that is just yellowing and disgusting, and there's nothing you can do about it, and that's inherent vice because it's just the nature of the thing itself. So the first force, um, and these are also in no particular order, so they're not by like greatest threat to worst threat, 
Um, but the first force we're going to talk about is physical forces. So that can be natural disasters or human error. Um, these range from fast and catastrophic physical forces, such as an earthquake, or if somebody bumps into an object or drops it. You'll see that's what happened on the picture over on left, right, wherever you're sitting at the far picture, uh, that object got knocked into, and so the shade itself shattered. Um, so that is fairly catastrophic. Um, or there's also slower acting forces that are sort of more minor but repeated opportunity for damage, uh, such as excessive touching or improper handling, um, or even vibrations from like, a nearby construction site, things like that. Uh, you'll see this other image up here um, is actually a, an example from Oxford University where they put up this piece where they invited the public to touch one half of it and not the other. And you can just see how just simple touch can deteriorate an object over time. Uh, so one of the risks of physical forces, breaks, loss, loose components, you know, pretty much what you'd expect. Um, and preventative measures are also pretty straightforward. You know, most damage from physical force is caused by kind of general use and accidents. So, you know, you put uh, artifacts under display cases, behind barriers, ensure proper handling techniques, things like that. Um, obviously, you can't prevent natural disasters. However, that's where the risk assessment part of this comes in. So, you know, if you're in an earthquake-prone area, you can by storage shelving and things like that that are actually designed to withstand vibrations from earthquakes or add stabilizing straps, things like that. Um, so there is something you can do to help mitigate these risks. Uh, so the next one is thieves and vandals. <laughs> um, could also be vandals. Uh, so thieves and vandals, examples obviously are plan theft by someone you know, intent on violating the collection, could be opportunistic theft by a visitor who just sees something shiny, puts it in the pocket, uh, embezzlement by staff, or just you know, vandalism, all of that. Um, risks, of course, also total loss of the object if it gets stolen. But there's also the side risk that if an object is stolen, it is subjected to the other forces, like physical force. You presume that somebody is not going to be take, handling it properly, or you know, subjecting it to proper storage temperatures, things like that, if it's you know, illegally being stored and sold, etc. cetera. Um, prevention, of course, you know, barriers, proximity alarms, security cameras, all of that. Um, but then museum, it's my job too to also be careful with our data. So if we publish access to our catalog online, for instance, there's a lot of information that we don't want to make public, you know, valuations, storage locations, things like that, that can also be clues for thieves to kind of plot out a, a heist or something like that. Um, I mean, see, these things happen. These two pictures I have up here are actually a theft that occurred at the Henry Sheldon Museum. Some guns were stolen, and the article underneath is they actually caught the guy, and some things were recovered, but not all of them. So it happens, <laughs> even in the little middle So the next agent is pollutants. Um, so that's particulates and gases that can be generated both outside and inside a building. Uh, in general, pollutants that are known to cause harm to human health can also cause damage to collections. Um, common examples are dirt, and dirt is actually a pollutant. Uh, soot, plastics, volatile comments from plastics in wood, pesticides, aerosols like household cleaners, bug spray, any of that stuff can all be harmful to collections. Um, the risks with this are that the particulates can actually just adhere to the surfaces and the chemicals can eat away at some finishes, you know, like wood finish and stuff like that. But then dust and dirt is actually a curious one because the dirt itself can be abrasive, so you don't want it to build up because that itself can harm the piece. But dirt can actually trap moisture and it can trap other chemicals, so it kind of sits in this chemical layer on top of an object if it's not regularly maintained. Um, so that kind of compounds the issues. So Prevention and response are maintaining proper maintenance schedules, so frequent dusting and vacuuming to help keep these things clean, um, and then also you can put protective covers on things to help avoid the accumulation of dust, because you also don't want to be cleaning things too often. Again, I think dust is abrasive, so every time you're kind of wiping off dust on the surface, you can cause these little scratches to the surface of an object. Um, there are also ways to manage use of chemicals, so if you need to use something in the space, like glass cleaner, for instance, you know, don't just spray it on, into the air, spray it on a paper towel, things like that. So there are ways to mitigate that. Um, this picture up here is a painting that actually came into the collection. You can see there's just layers of dust and dirt on it. And you can see the condition overall, the painting is not that good. So we had a conservator come clean it. Yes, okay. 
how do you actually decide when to implement any of these risk prevention me measures? So like, if you're gonna, you know, some new object, it's gonna cost a lot of money to build an enclosure to protect it from this. Like, how do you actually calculate is it worth spending the money to build this enclosure to protect this thing or just sort of? Yeah, that's a big part of my job. So I also do acquisitions. So if somebody offers me something for a donation, you know, to accept in the collection, that's exactly part of, there is just, it's a risk metric rubric thing that I have to go through of, okay, do we have the ability to properly store it? Do we have the ability to properly display it? Would it require conservation? Would it put other things at risk? Would it require more funds that would take away funds from something else? Is it in better condition than something we have that might be posing bigger risks to the other pieces? So yeah, that's a huge part of my job because exactly, you just gotta look at your budget and you know see things come with it. Like sometimes people will offer a gift um, to donate, but then they will also offer funds to help conserve it. So a lot of different things go into that calculus. So it's it's a big question, and that's where there often are collections committees and things. Like I don't independently make decisions of what comes in and out of the collection for exactly these reasons. But there's so many different things to consider. Um, so yeah, yeah. Please put your desk. All right. So that brings us to custodial neglect and dissociation. So this one really boils down to, I just need to do my job. <laughs> so an example of it is just when active care is not being taken on the collection. So dissociation of collections objects and their records means, you know, if I find a chair sitting there and it doesn't have a number, I don't have any idea what this chair is, where it came from, anything about it, that's kind of dissociation. And that can be extremely harmful to the collection because if we want to get rid of the chair, for instance, but I don't know where it came from, I don't know if we own it, maybe it's a loan, any of these things. If we can't properly care for it, get rid of it, do anything to it, conserve it, if we don't have that information. Um, so that one's a uh, big one as well. Um, the fifth one today is light. So light can include visible light, ultraviolet light, infrared light, light, all, love, all the light can be damaging to artifacts. So damage from radiation is a function of light intensity times length of exposure. So therefore, even low intensity light over a long period of time can be very harmful to an object. Um, so the risks or damage from exposure to light really is cumulative and it's irreversible. It's not something that you can have conserved. Um, common impacts are fading, discoloration, uh, as well as unseen chemical changes that can cause embrittlement, particularly in organic objects. Um, the example on the far side there is actually pictures from the Sheldon Museum of the, some original wallpaper that's in one of our rooms. The wallpaper dates about the 1890s. And those are two pictures from the same room. And the one on the top is I took from a spot that's directly across from a bunch of windows. And the one on the bottom is kind of around the corner, sort of behind an object. It doesn't get as much light. So you can see clearly just how damaging light can be to objects. So prevention. It's not that much you can do. Um, if you want to have something on display, it is going to be subjected to visible light or other kinds of light. But you, know, you can try to store artifacts away from the direct light as much as you can. Um, like this picture down here, be helpful to add curtains or something to kind of try to minimize that bright light spot that's on the top. Um, but also minimize the amount and duration of time artifacts are on display. So you know, rotating exhibits is a good way to prevent that. Um, but also you can use handheld light monitors to help monitor that exposure over time so you can really take measurements of the light and see how harmful will this be in what amount of time. Um, you can also add, for things you can't move like wallpaper, you can you know, implement UV films on the windows, um, installing motion sensors on gallery lights so that the lights aren't just on all the time if no one's in there. Um, and using LEDs can also help because LEDs don't emit ultraviolet light, so they're used a lot in museum lighting. So a little less tangent. So the next one we'll talk about is incorrect temperature. So temperature is measure heat energy, and damage can occur when temperature is either too high or too low. Um, the risks, of course, are increased rate of chemical reactions, it can soften materials, it can desiccate organic materials at high temperatures. Low temperatures can often cause hazing and cracking of objects. Um, and also the temperature directly impacts relative humidity, which I'll talk about next. Um, so it's constantly, the fluctuating temperature will cause the relative humidity to fluctuate, and it's this bad cycle for objects. 
Um, the detrimental effects of incorrect temperature are often observed after a considerable amount of time has passed. So the damage of temperature is often underestimated, and it is also hard to separate from relative humidity, so it doesn't maybe get as much attention as it should. Um, recommended prevention is to try to keep temperature between 65 and 72 degrees. Um, which you know, means keeping artifacts out of the attics and basements and other spaces that are more prone to dramatic swings in temperatures. Um, these pieces of equipment on the far side are pictures of just different devices used to monitor temperature and humidity in museums. Uh, you'll see these, the top picture, you'll see those tucked away in corners of museum a lot and a lot of people don't know what they are. And so that one is one of the oldest examples and it's called a high growth thermograph. <laughs> And so it charts both temperature and humidity with just kind of a little stylus. So you can see the two lines, one's temperature and one's humidity. And it'll just make a graph of it consistently. And it actually runs on humid hair, which is a little weird. But if you think about hair and it expands and contracts in humidity, and so it uses that same concept of the expansion and the, tr the contraction, and it'll chart that changes in the humidity over time. So it's kind of cool. It's very old tech, but it's high tech old tech. Um, the one in the middle is called a precision digital thermohygrometer. <laughs> and that one is great because you can just look at it and tell exactly what the temperature is, but it doesn't have any logging capabilities. Um, but they're teeny tiny, they're maybe about one inch big. So you might, if you go to a museum, you'll notice them tucked in cases a lot. That's what that is, it's just monitoring that. And then the one on the bottom is a data logger. That's just a digital thing that is used in most museums today. And that will chart current and past trends and the conditions overall. and it'll analyze it all for you and tell you if there's mold risk and everything and it's really nice. <laughs> all right so for incorrect relative humidity as i mentioned it's expressed it's a ratio expressed in a percent generally between the mass of water vapor in a fixed volume of air so that's the absolute humidity and the maximum mass amount of water vapor that a fixed volume of air could hold without condensation so at, at the current temperature it's at so organic materials and some inorganic materials will absorb and give off moisture to try to find a balance between their moisture and the moisture in the air. Um, so relative humidity in the air goes up, these others will absorb the moisture and swell. Relative humidity goes down, they will give off moisture and shrink. Um, so it's really harmful for overall collections to have wildly fluctuating relative humidity. Um, so again, you really want to try to keep your humidity stable between about 35 and 55%, depends on the time of year, depends on collections, like paper-based um, collections tend to like to be a little bit drier. Um, <clears throat> it's difficult to control relative humidity, especially in historic house museums, because a lot of these buildings were not built to do humidification or dehumidification. You know, it's easier to add temperature controls in a space than it is humidification. Um, these old buildings, often have building envelope issues, so if you're going to try to humidify or dehumidify a space, if your building is leaky you know, around the windows or seals, you're just going to be trying to humidify the outside. It's a losing battle. Or if you're going to go through the trouble of sealing up the envelope and adding all this duct work that's really invasive and can be very harmful to historic houses. But then additionally, this is something that you know I think about a lot as far as adding humidity to a space that has not been humidified before. Is there's not a lot of data or research about the impact on collections to add humidification and dehumidification to a space that hasn't had it for centuries. And so the Henry Sheldon Museum, for instance, has never had a humidifier or a dehumidifier. All of a sudden, we add that into a space. These objects have been kind of breathing with the, se the seasons for centuries. Does that actually negatively harm these things? And there's not a lot of research about that, but it is kind of a conversation that I hear sort of starting in the museum community, and I think it's one that's really interesting. Um, so that sort of brings me to water. Um, water, obviously, sources natural occurrences, mechanical failure, or human error. You accidentally knock over your glass of water. I'm sure we've all done that to our laptops before. Um, risk, exposure to water alone does not actually cause extreme or instant damage to objects. I think in many conservation treatments actually involve water. Um, however, it's when, and when materials are exposed to large quantities of water at once, such as a pipe burst or a flood, um, it can cause saturation or fragility, warping, tide lines, and it can actually also inhibit mold growth, so that's another big concern with the interaction with water. You'll see the picture on the far side there. 
I don't know what happened to this object, but clearly it got exposed to water at some point, whether it was a flood or what. You can see on the very the bottom kind of third, there's a tide line that goes all the way up that bottom third of the barrel. So clearly it sustained some water damage. Um, so prevention, water leaks and floods are the most common. Um, Collection storage areas, unfortunately, are frequently placed in attics and basements where they are most vulnerable to water damage uh, in the event of a roof leak, plumbing leak, sprinkler system malfunction, or then flooding from the basement. So it's important as a preventative measure to really try to avoid that location for collection storage, um, but also to put things in proper enclosures. So proper museum storage boxes can actually really help with water a lot. You don't want to, maybe counterintuitively, you don't want to actually put things into plastic because that can create microclimates. So there are special archival boxes that kind of help regulate temperature, humidity, all those things, but it will actually really protect objects from water um, if a decent amount. Um, you also want to try to store objects at least six inches off the floor to help protect from flooding. Um, Sometimes you'll see in some storage facilities that they'll put plastic sheeting over units to help try to protect from sprinkler leaks or floods or roof leaks. And there's actually some debate about whether or not that's a good practice in the museum field because while it would help uh, protect collections if there is a leak, if there's a fire, it causes whole other series of problems with that plastic sheeting is then going to catch on fire and melt all over your collection. So there is some debate and it's I think very interesting. <laughs> um, all right, so that brings me to a fire. <laughs> um, there are five different classes of fire. Uh, class A is the ordinary combustible, so most of the things you think about wood, cloth, paper, rubber, plastics. Class B is flammable liquids and gases, um, petroleum greases, gasoline, tars, oils, oil based paints, solvents, alcohols, all that stuff. Um, class C, electrical fires, class D, combustible metals, and class K are grease and cooking fires. So fire is considered to be the greatest threat to museum collections and cultural properties because it can lead to so such quick and catastrophic total loss of a collection, just like nothing, unlike any of these other threats. Um, even if objects are not consumed by a fire, fire can also damage, uh, or fire damage can occur from smoke, soot deposits, as well as the process of extinguishing the fire can be extremely dangerous to collections. Um, in the picture on the far side, that is actually a picture of soot being cleaned off of the painting. So it, you can kind of see where they started in that big black line there is the soot that's on the painting. Um, fire can also lead to total loss of electricity, heating, cooling, security, all of the other agents I talked about. So fire is also compounds all of those other factors that if you think about if there's a massive fire, you're much more vulnerable to theft, vandalism, just bad conditions, mold is huge, all of the above. Um, prevention, fire prevention in museums should be given the highest priority possible. This includes fire detection, fire suppression, proper prevention and containment practices. But of course, in the event of a fire, human life is always top priority. So the collections really do kind of have to be on their own if there's a fire. Um, so there are some prevention and containment practices that you can do in advance to help prevent a fire and to help protect from fire, including the use of fire rated cabinetry to protect objects. So you can put things in the cabinets, like your files, records, things like that to help keep the fire out. But then you can also put your known flammable objects in fire cabinets so that they don't cause a fire, or if in the case that there is a fire, they don't add to the combustion, add a fuel source. So you know, there's a lot to talk about. If you have guns in your collection, you want a gun safe for security, but it's also a fire code regulation because guns will have like gunpowder and stuff like that, and if there's a fire, then they will you know, explode. It's gunpowder, and so then that just fuels the fire even more. So there are some things you can do like that. Um, you can also be really careful with selection of things like exhibit materials. You know, a lot of that stuff is super flammable, so try to look for materials that are fire rated or hot protective coatings on them, things like that. Um, and then in, in a situation where you do have fire suppression, so like sprinklers, 
um, you need to make sure that you ensure 18 inches of clearance below the sprinklers. So it's really tempting, especially in museum storage, no museum ever in the entire world, and I can say this as a fact, has enough storage space. <laughs> so it is so tempting to just use that vertical space. 18 inches is quite a lot. You can fit a lot of objects above 18 inches. But if you have a sprinkler system and you have objects stacked right up against it so that it can't actually function properly, then you're defeating the entire purpose of having it. Um, so I did want to talk a little bit about fire suppression. It isn't in and of itself an agent of deterioration, but fire suppression is so important because it can be just as damaging to museum collections as fire. Well, maybe not just as damaging, but very damaging. Um, not every museum, especially older historic house museums, are able to support a full suppression system. So at very least, there should be appropriately rated fire extinguishers. Um, so fire extinguishers, most common type of fire in a museum are really most buildings, unless you have strange special, specialty collections. Um, or they're class A, B, or C, so you can get a common dry chemical extinguisher that will have an ABC rating, so that'll make it appropriate for use for all three of the classes. Um, but these chemicals can be very damaging to the collections. So if the museum has the budget, space, etc., the most common system that you'll see are sprinkler systems. And there's a bunch of different types of sprinkler systems, including wet, spray, dry, and mist. And I won't go into the details of the difference between all those, but um, generally, sprinkler systems are good in museums because water is a known agent. It is an agent of deterioration, but it is a known agent. You can salvage wet materials. You can't salvage burnt materials. Um, mist systems are good, and they're becoming a, sort of more popular in museums, but they're newer, so their full capacity is not quite known yet. Uh, but it uses high pressurized water, so you can hopefully put out a fire with much, much less water, because um, the amount of water that comes out of the sprinkler system is a lot. Um, the sprinkler systems are bad in, for museum collections because, as I mentioned, the volume of water can be extremely damaging, the pipes can be really dirty, you don't know what else is going to come out of those pipes. Um, and, but generally speaking, it does, it does what it needs to, right? As long as it puts out the fire, you're good. Um, and the other thing you'll see in museums a lot are called clean agent systems. So by definition, a clean agent is a gaseous fire suppressant that's electrically non-conducting and that does not leave a residue upon evaporation. That's the definition of clean agent systems. Um, this is ideal in museum environment because it doesn't harm the collections. It just it kills the fire by various means of suffocating it or reacting with the reactions between the chemicals and you know all the really sciencey stuff, but it's great for museum collections. However, when you look at your clean agent options, it gets a little bit dicey. So halon systems are one that were really popular in museums for a while because they are non-toxic, odorless, colorless, uh, it extinguishes the fire by simply chemically reaction, reacting with the combustion process. So it doesn't really have any residue. The cleanup is minimal. It seems perfect. However, uh, Halon was banned globally in 1987 <laughs> because it has extremely high potential for ozone depletion, which is not great. So museums that already had a Halon system can keep using it legally, but Buying Halon is very expensive and it's difficult and you don't you know, want to be contributing to global warming. So the alternatives though are really untested. So there's a lot of different clean agents being used right now, but nobody really has enough data to say it's 100 percent safe for museum collections. The chemicals, whatever the reactions are, wouldn't be harmful in some way. Um, now carbon dioxide is also technically a clean agent. Um, it's often classified differently due to the dangers associated with it. So it can be very effective in putting out a fire because it just removes the oxygen in a room. But in order for a CO2 system to be effective as a fire suppressant, it has to be worked into a space that's completely sealed, so you can't have any oxygen leaking in or out. And you also, if you're a human being in this space, you get an alarm, you have to leave. Otherwise, you are trapped in a sealed room filled with CO2, and you have low chances of surviving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So given what you were just also saying about the envelope and 
Yeah, how does space museums, I'm assuming that this is not really an option for Right, yeah, so CO2 okay. systems are not very common for exactly the threat to life safety and just the practicality of it. I think they're used a lot for, you know, if you have extreme electrical equipment or, you know, things that there aren't really people there anyway. Um, but the other problem with CO2 is even if you have those kinds of spaces, um, first responders will have a hard time getting in because it has to be left alone long enough to see if you clear out, etc. So, not a great option. Um, again, we the storm out there. <laughs> when the halo system was in use, how was that? Like, was it also like, like to the ceiling or something? Yeah, my understanding is it is just in you know tanks and it gets just piped into the room. And I don't think. I, my understanding of the panel system, I guess, is a little more limited. I don't think it has to have quite as sealed an environment as CO2. Um, I might be wrong about that, but it is theoretically safe for human beings, so that's where it's like it won't kill you. There's some debate about that too, but generally speaking. <laughs> so, you know, and that's where it gets complicated. Fire suppression is complicated with museum collections because there's not really a good way to do it, but no matter how you do it, it's better than everything burning. Do you think there are so many different ways to ruin all of these precious objects, <laughs> and it's kind of on you if something does? How much of this is like legitimately exciting and challenging, and how much is like unbelievably stressful and not um, fun? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I I enjoy thinking you know creatively and critically about things like this, and so. You know, is it stressful knowing that the Shelby Museum is there and we don't have fire suppression other than fire extinguishers? Yep. <laughs> um, but, you know, at the same time, this is where this type of risk assessment is important for, you know, mental health, peace of mind, just knowing that you're doing what you can, right? There's nothing else that I could be doing for the Shelton collection. I can't put in a sprinkler system or a halon system or, you know, there's, there's no other option. So that's where it is exactly my role to make sure that I can assess these risks do what I can about them, and then the rest of it is just kind of cross fingers and hold breath. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah, what is a dry sprinkler system? <laughs> yeah, so wet sprinkler systems mean you have the pipes and the water is just sitting there. It's ready. You know, if it gets triggered, water goes. Dry sprinkler systems mean that the pipes are actually filled with air or gas and the water is in tanks. So that has some benefits for museum collections because it's less likely to have leaks from the system or things like that, but there is a lag time inherent. So if the sprinkler gets triggered, it releases valves, releases the water, and then the water will come out. That lag can take even up to a minute. So if you're talking about fire and museum collections, you know, so there is, again, some debate of whether dry sprinkler systems are better for museums or not less risk of leaks and floods and things like that, but that little bit of delay might just be costly enough. Yeah. Jeez, we don't flood, do we? <laughs> Did you have a question? Oh, no, okay. Um, yes, okay, I think that's all I'm going to say about fire suppression right now, but I could talk about this for far too long. Um, yeah, okay, moving on. <laughs> the last stage in the deterioration. Pests. <laughs> Starting on a high note, or ending on a high note, right? Um, animals and microorganisms are attracted to and capable of consuming or otherwise damaging museum collections and or their storage of materials are what are classified as museum pests. And all of them is puppies, but not all of them really are attracted to eating things that you find in museum collections. Um, so we have, it's probably really hard, oh, but impossible to see, but there's a list of the dirty dozen of museum pests. So these are kind of what are identified as the 12 most risky pests in museum. So I am not by any means an entomologist, but I make sure that I will recognize these bugs if I see them in the museum and the types of damage that they can cause. Um, so those teeny tiny pictures all the way on the far side, you can see that there's just little piles next to the pieces there. It just looks like sawdust. And that's actually evidence of a powder post beetle infestation, unfortunately. And that, so I went out into the barn and I saw those telltale little piles. And that means that there's beetles that are boring in and that's the, you know, what they've eaten and they've kicked out the other side. So things like that. Um, so the dirty dozen of museum pests really mostly 
breaks down to moths, various beetles, silverfish, book lice, roaches, and mice. Different kinds of moths and beetles, but. Um, <laughs> uh, microorganisms like mold can also cause catastrophic damage, so it's not technically an animal pest in that sense, but it is considered under the pest scope of agency deterioration. Um, nests also of other things, like you don't really have to worry about bats in a museum, for instance, but nests of bats or birds can also affect museum collections because they will attract insects that will then go looking for another food source. Um, so risks, obviously, pests survive. But it can lead to total loss of collections um, if you don't monitor it. According to museumpests.net, which is just a great time if you're looking for a really interesting website, um, <laughs> up to 54% of collections have reported damage from pests. So they are not a small problem. Um, with pre prevention, early detection is so important. So that just means that I have to be regularly monitoring the spaces, um, thorough maintenance, you know, cleaning up those corners so you don't make little attractive houses for you know, spiders and bugs and the spiders that can have bugs and bugs. Um, so tips for keeping collections safe from pests include using inert materials in your storage. So you want to use a polyethylene foam versus cotton or wool, you know, things that would again be crazy to bugs. Um, well sealed storage cabinets again, but then also it comes back to keeping temperature and RH low. So bugs really like most warm environments. So if you keep that temperature consistent, then that kind of helps with that as well. Um, now, part of regular pest management is also crucial to have an IPM, so an integrated pest management plan. Um, so similar to fire suppression, pest control methods in and of themselves can be high risk to museum collections. Um, improper pest control can really be just as damaging as the pests themselves. The term integrated pest management was actually first used in the 1970s in agriculture um, in response to growing knowledge about the negative side effects of pesticide overuse from crops. So in the 80s, the trend caught on in cultural institutions and their new ways of dealing with pests were promoted by integrating pest management into collections practices. Um, so, for example, in the event of a pest infestation, museums really don't want to fumigate because that just subjects everything in the building, the collections, to a myriad of chemicals, and that's not great. Uh, um, so treatment methods that we use now include like deep freezing. So the museum also has a beautiful moth infestation that occurred in 2020. So during COVID, the space were unoccupied, they weren't being monitored, it's perfect for pests to come in. And so this rug up there is actually being completely eaten by clothes moths. And so all that damage is eggs, frost, bugs, not good. Um, but so how you combat that is you put it through a freezer cycle. So you have to freeze it for a week at negative 10 degrees, take it out for a week to let the eggs, which would probably survive the first time, hatch, and then freeze it again to re-kill any larvae. So it is a massive undertaking and it is not my favorite part of my job. <laughs> yes. Do you have the freezer or did you have to bring that somewhere? And we bought a massive chest freezer, kind of like one you might just have in your own garage or basement, but you have to make sure it's capable of getting down to negative degrees. So yep, massive chest freezer, just bag things, cycle them in and out, and then uh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I have one more slide here. That would be ten, <laughs> the ten agents of deterioration. But there is um, a conservator. Her name is Angelica Isa, and she has argued for adding an eleventh agent. And she poses this question: of What happens if all the work we do is useless because no one knows about it? And I think that that is so relevant because you know we could be doing everything right at you know, the Sheldon or anywhere, and if no one's ever heard of us, no one ever goes there, you know, what's the point of that? Is that not in and of itself harmful to the collections? Like, they're just going to kind of waste away over there? So, just a little, little something to think about, but, you know, also makes me say thank you, especially for inviting me here today and bringing all of this work we're doing at the Sheldon to all of you here. And that is it. Questions? A lot of information, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's first thank Allison. Yeah. Before. <laughs> I have a question. When you um, do enter museum lanes or something like mm -hmm. that, 
like do you have a whole set of um, whether a protocol or whatever, like yeah. quarantine or transport or you know, depending, depending yeah. on what you're mm -hmm. yeah, so you the pre set guidelines for this things depend on the object. Yeah, exactly. The kind of pre loan time, there's a lot of that technical stuff that goes on. What is pretty common is that you'll request well, it depends on which way it goes. You know, if we want to, if a museum is requesting an object from our collection, you typically would request a facilities report. So that museum should have, there's a standardized document that everyone fills out, and it includes information. Okay, like where would you want it on display? What are the security protocols that are in place there? You oftentimes will have to submit a year's worth of environmental data. Um, and so there's all of that that goes with it. And then, of course, you have, you know, all the legalese and say, like, you know, if you break it, you buy it. Ooh, man, we're in trouble now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Gosh. I guess it's a storm alert. So I guess so. Yeah, I have some. Jeez. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, not at all. Um, I had the so, sound turned off, so I so we don't feel very It's life safety. <laughs> but that's a really good point, though, too, as far as, you know, objects moving around. It is generally less of a concern when you're loading from another museum that you would kind of hope and assume that it wouldn't come with pests if it's already in another museum. But, you know, a quarantine period is typically advised, but that's a huge issue with taking new donations. You don't know where things have been. You don't know if they've had bugs. So it's very difficult to isolate things for at least two weeks, so that tends to be when you see pest activity, um, or you know, bag them to really kind of trap them in an environment. But that's actually, I mean, I know it all came around in COVID, but the moth infestation at the Sheldon we suspect came from an incoming donation. Um, and so, and that happens, it happens. And you know, it's hard, again, small historic house museums, we don't have state-of-the-art facilities where we have a quarantine room. Like, you know, it's not necessarily always feasible to really isolate things for that long. Or, you know, powder post beetles, for instance, they really only come out in cycles about once every year. Like, they burrow, you know, they stay in there, and then in the springtime, they kind of come out, and, you know, their larva hatches and all that stuff. So it's really difficult, because it's not practical to, get a loan or accession a new item and leave it sealed up in a bag next to nothing for a year. So yeah, it's a huge risk for sure. Sure. <laughs> but no, isn't is there any kind of way to detect these things other than visual? Like, uh, like a bug like x-ray kind of like <laughs> level or whatever it is. That are there other methods or means? Are you talking mostly about pests? Well, just in general, yeah, but you have the kinds of risks, well, I suppose, or deterioration, like, it's a, it's a visual kind of inspection, mostly. I think, yeah, mostly, if I'm understanding your question. Like, yeah, you, the rest of these agents, right, again, they're outside forces. So the only one that I think maybe apply to that would be the pests. Yeah, and so, yeah, yeah. it's just, it is a visual. You can look for, again, signs of damage. Like, for instance, powder post beetles have that really telltale tail little holes. So if you see a ton of little holes in the leg of your wooden table, I would be nervous. I wouldn't accept it as a collection and things like that. But yeah, the rest of these, you know, like water age temperature, like there's not really other threats. You know, if you take a piece that's been cracked from humidity, it's not going to humidify anything <laughs> next to it, you know, things like that. Ooh, no. <laughs> okay, awesome. So you call this your PowerPoint of worry. So what would you say is actually your, your top worry? Well, I, that was almost too easy to answer right now because I am dealing with these pest infestations. So that is very active in my day-to-day -day <laughs> work. But, you know, the rest of it, it is interesting because kind of what I was saying before, there's a certain degree where I just can't worry about these things. You know, I know it's not in my power to control the relative humidity, for instance. But, you know, I just do what I can. Like, for instance, when I talked about the relationship between temperature and relative humidity, if it gets warm in my office, I'll, you know, kind of hesitate to turn on the air conditioning unit because the cooler I make my office, the higher the relative humidity is going to get. So, you know, while it may be warm in the office and high temperature is not good for the objects, 
high urine relative humidity is also not good. And then that process of turning on the AC and then turning it off, that fluctuation in temperature is even worse than bad. And so, you know, it is just those little day-to-day -day decisions that kind of just try to mitigate as best as I can. And that really just comes with the job territory of, yeah, it's a lot of responsibility to be the essentially a caretaker for these objects and you know to you know, speak for them, make sure that they're stored okay, put them on exhibit, interpret them, make sure I know what everything is, and yeah, it's I love it, but it's a lot of work. Yeah. Do you have a question? I was just wondering, if, uh, do you feel like you get rewarded for taking successful preventative measures, or is your job basically? If something goes wrong, it's on you, and if everything going, is going fine, then you don't really get the, maybe the recognition that it took to yeah. make sure that he's running fine. Yeah, that's a funny question, because I always wonder why people are goalies in sports, because I feel like it's the same thing. If, like, if, if something goes in, it's your fault. If nothing comes your way, then nobody cares. So I feel like it's sort of like that, right? You know, if somebody comes to your museum, they're not going to be like, oh, wow, your temperature is exquisite. You know, so <laughs> a little bit of that, but you know, at the same time, you know, you do get the rewards insofar as people, I think most of it, I guess, comes down to sort of the curation of like putting things out and saying, look at all this cool stuff that we're taking care of. And people can say, wow, that's cool. And so, you know, that feels nice. <laughs> but you know, mostly not really. <laughs> do you have a question? I do, but seeing the picture of the Sheldon there, like, mm -hmm. Because it's a historic structure, how do you consider, you've talked about objects, do you consider the structure itself in this context? That's a really interesting question because it depends based on the museum. So the museum I was at prior to this one is a Victorian mansion and the interiors are historically landmarked. And so that building, really the building is essentially a collections object because we know, you know, we have to track the condition and history and sourcing for you know, the wallpaper, the sconces, the, everything like that. Whereas the Sheldon Museum, the Sheldon was never really maintained like that. It wasn't so much about the historic structure as it was the collections, and that was really just from the origination point. Henry Sheldon, so the, the building is cool. It was built by marble merchants in Millbury. They rented a marble mill that's down, you know, still there today. And so there's a lot of marble components in the building, and again, so there's valuable things. But Henry's just a boarder here, and he just also then decided to amass huge amounts of collections and then took over the third floor while he was living there and then bought part of the building. And so the building wasn't really like some historic homes where people's you know, stately mansions and things like that. And so it depends on how it's been preserved over time. So there is one room though with the Egyptian wallpaper I showed you, that gets treated more like an object because that wallpaper is original, it's historically significant, things like that. Whereas there's other rooms that have been repainted a thousand times, the windows are new, it, it was never really maintained in one specific way. So in this instance, we don't necessarily treat the building like collections, but sometimes do. That's not anything. Hi, let's thank Allison again. All right.